Hi. Hi, and welcome to this great, um, great part of the Offshore 2017. We've got, at this moment, we've got three specialists on something that you absolutely have to know more about. And I, I'd say everyone has to know more about that. It's about whistleblowers, protection of whistleblowers, uh, legislation on, on, on how to go on yes. with that. Not so a lot of people are here. Okay. we've got the specialists here. And we've got specialists from all over the world for you. Especially <laughs> Silette, who comes from Melbourne, from the university there. And uh, so I think she has the longest commute to get to this festival here, so give her a big hand of applause. <laughs> and if you want to know why she's here, well, there's, there's things about hacking and about whistleblowing, but she wrote the book on hacking. She is, she wrote the book with Julian Assange, so she's, I mean, she wrote the book. Come on. <laughs> Better. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the other things is what she did is that she started she, she founded Blueprint for Free Speech. And Blueprint is an organization uh, that helps out with legislation for whistleblowers. And bo both uh, Canel and Veronica are both working for... Working for? for? Yeah, working for Blueprint. So that... Yeah, they, they, they do something. Um, Canel uh, is working on a PhD on uh, human rights and whistleblowers. Um, Veronica is working on better legislation in Europe for whistleblowers. So please, people, give them, a, give them all a big hand, and the floor is theirs. So we, we're making this a bit of a, a panel conversation. Um, uh, and I will tell you a little bit about um, uh, Canel Levit uh, and Veronica Nad. Canel uh, has a background as an anthropologist with a degree from... No. That's, That's Veronica. Me. Sorry, Veronica has a degree in cultural anthropology from a German uh, university, which is really hard to pronounce. <laughs> also, it's in Mainz. Yeah, that one. And, uh, and a master's degree from there. And anthropology is actually very important if you want to understand uh, whistleblowers, how they think, what their needs are in organizations, and how organizations respond to them. Canel is doing her PhD uh, in law at Bremen University, uh, and she's got a focus in her research on whistleblowing. I do research at the University of Melbourne. Uh, I'm interested in the technologies, particularly anonymity, anonymity and technologies that affect uh, whistleblowers. Whistleblowing and whistleblowers have been a sort of a long-term topic here at this series of events. So if you think to two SHA equivalents ago, um, uh, Julian Assange uh, opened the proceedings. WikiLeaks was emerging as a major force, as a publisher, uh, revealing things that whistleblowers provided to it on an anonymous basis through a, at that time, very innovative anonymous electronic Dropbox. Uh, and then if we step forward to OHM four years ago, uh, so four years beyond the, the one before that, uh, we saw that we had Jesslyn Raddick and Tom Drake, uh, Colleen Rowley, um, who, and, and, uh, and other members of um, organizations that are secret by nature, whether they're the USDOJ or the FBI or the CIA or the NSA, uh, and talking about their whistleblowing or the work that they do with whistleblowers. So there's clearly been a, a long and close relationship between the audience and the continuing audience at this event and whistleblowing. So we look at a world that has evolved very strangely since the last US election, with uh, President Trump in power, a changing of the guard, and perhaps a little bit of a sense of despair among some people about what does this mean for the future and what does it mean for the future of whistleblowing. We see an onslaught of offensive technologies, of, of methods of using metadata to track whistleblowers uh, and find their identities. We see uh, convictions of people like CIA whistleblower Jeffrey Sterling that appear to be pretty much solely on the basis of metadata. Uh, and that raises questions about is the world going to shit for whistleblowers. But we actually have a little bit of good news, not complete good news, but a little bit of good news about some progress that's been happening here in Europe 
um, uh, around protections for whistleblowers um, that both uh, of my colleagues here will speak to you uh, about today. And the first person who's going to speak, Veronica, uh, will talk about three cases. We're we going to do three cases. Yes? Yes. Three cases, um, which uh, are around a case in Ireland, a case in Spain, uh, and a case in... Bosnia. Bosnia, Herzegovina. Yes, okay. Um, and then Canel will come on and speak about the LuxLeaks case, a Luxembourg case, and in a sense, her step will be a step from taking it to more country-specific whistleblowing to a broader pan-European whistleblowing topic, that is, how whistleblowing in one country, particularly financial whistleblowing, then has tentacles that impact surrounding uh, countries. Um, and this will point the way to some discussion of what is currently now on the discussion agenda, which is a EU directive on whistleblower protection. So, I'll lead you to jump in. Thank you, Celeste. On that, Veronica, thank okay. you. Okay, so just to start, and introducing you to the problem, what it actually means to be a whistleblower, I'm gonna let one of them speak for himself, who's Jonathan Sugarman from, well, Israel originally, but he blew the whistle in Ireland as a um, risk manager at the Irish branch of the Italian bank Unicredit, if I can make this work, yes. C can we jump in and say, Veronica did this interview with Jonathan Sugarman, uh, and it's part of a project that Blueprint for Switch is part of a, a set of NGOs called Change of Direction in Europe Project. You can search for them and, and find terrific material on the site for whistleblowers and about whistleblowers. Exactly. Yes. And I've just realized we don't have audio, I think, on the video, <laughs> so maybe... The tech angels can help. Ah, now we do. We do, buddy. I saw a problem with the information that my department was producing almost from the first week I worked at Unicredit. Uh, obviously, I was very worried about it. We're talking about billions. Once I reported a breach to the Central Bank of Ireland, and the breach was 20 times the permissible deviation. So the law says you can go, you're allowed to go up to 100 kilometers per hour. If there's a mistake, you can go to 101, but 101 is already a problem. And I walk in through the door and I said, I'm at 120. The reports were signed not only by my boss, but my other, the other managers in the bank. They have to sign off every day to know that this is, these are the risk figures for the bank. My uh, CEO kept saying, no, 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 you know, you're new here, you know, I've been here a long time. I used to be the head of trading and the head of treasury in this bank many years ago before I went back to Italy. And I said, he said, it's okay. And I said, how do you know that it's okay? We're talking about a 30 billion bank. Are you running the balance sheet on a beer coaster? That was pretty much the moment of no return when they rang me at home one evening and said, Jonathan, you told the regulator that you're at 120, but you're actually at 140. So I went in the next day and resigned because the law was quite clear. It said five years in prison. In banking, we knew already in 2006 that you know, we're coming to the end of the party. And so, effectively, Lehman collapsed over liquidity. They ran out of liquidity. And my whole issue with Unicredit is, we did not know our liquidity. Now it turns out everybody was short. And nobody went to jail, nobody, you didn't do anything. Obviously, I wasn't the flavor of the month with a lot of people in the bank. In terms of retaliation, yes, things got very bad. I um, found it effectively impossible to find another job. Effectively, I was put in a position where I, an employee of the bank, was forced to, con to behave criminally. Now, no employer on the planet should be allowed to force an employee to conduct a crime. And so when I started dealing with lawyers, with journalists, 
uh, the bank started threatening me, either directly or through the bank's own lawyers. Um, later on, people walked up to me in one or two conferences and said to me, Jonathan, 20 years ago, you'd be dead by now. I've been in hospital on more than one occasion, uh, suffering from depression, uh, from anxiety. I um, have lost everything that I ever had. Definitely. Definitely. Because I get to sleep at night. Okay, so yeah, that's the story of Jonathan, and I gotta okay. And so it's in a way a very classical whistleblower story because Jonathan. So there was a wrongdoing. Jonathan made a report, and um, was that ne report was neglected. He lost his job, not because he was fired, but because he had to resign, as he explained. And, and up until today, he's without a job and was neither reinstated nor compensated for his actions. And that happening regardless of the fact that he mobilized local Irish politicians. He took his story to Brussels. He wrote a book about his experience as a whistleblower. And Ireland, in the meantime, even passed a law protecting whistleblowers that's not valid for him in retrospect. And um, so he's still depressed and uh, without a job, as we already heard, and uh, actually in need of healthcare support. So other cases that um, we came across these past couple of years and which are actually very interesting is, for example, the case of Anna, Anna Garrido to the left, who is a former local government employee in Boadilla de Monte, in the uh, Madrid metropolitan area, who disclosed information about a local mayor in her district that acted far beyond his remit, um, named Arturo Gonzalez, who was actually later even named in the Panama Papers. And the investigations into her disclosures uh, led to the unraveling of the Gürtel, Gürtel case, which is one of Spain's largest corruption scandals in recent histories and implicates dozens of officers of the right wing, conservative right wing um, People's Party, I think they're called. And the estimated money loss to public finances caused by the corruption that Anna um, revealed in, goes up to 120 million euros. And um, today, Investigations and trials are ongoing, but Anna, at the same time, is who got harassed for disclosing the information she um, disclo uh, yeah. uh, lost her job, got depressed, was even awarded 90, well, close to 100,000 euros in moral damages for workplace harassment that she never received because um, her former employer put in an appeal at the trial. And she won several whistleblower awards and joined a platform that supports whistleblowers in Spain called Plataforma por la Honestidad. Um, but now lives in Palma de Mallorca and is selling self-made or handmade jewelry to tourists because she cannot work in her former work environment. And the third case I would like to talk about to you is the mm -hmm. case of um, the employees of the Tuzla Quartz Mining Company in Bosnia, who, as we can see, dug their own graves in a response to the retaliation they suffered from the state of Bosnia. What happened was that the employees of the local mining company blew the whistle on a regional mining minister who had forced them to pay a bribe of 15,000 euros in order to obtain an extension on their mining license. And um, what followed was systematic a systematic retaliation campaign against the employees and particularly the director of the family-run company um, that included seizing of company assets, freezing of bank accounts, and even the ransacking 
of uh, ransacking and burning of uh, administrative offices of the company. And um, the employees uh, even went on a hunger strike um, to protest again what happened to them. And only after 18 months and after a couple of them had actually threatened to jump off a 35-meter silo, the government finally granted their mining license. And now that minister is on trial. And this case sparked huge outrage in Bosnia. Um, the company is back in business, and as I said, the guy is on, finally on trial, but still, it's an ordeal that they had to go through. I mean, it's still a slightly more positive outcome than for Jonathan or Anna, maybe also due to the fact that they're in a bigger group and there's an entire company and there's involved and there's a village that's supporting their case, but um, still, though. Um, so these are just a couple of consequences. Uh, that people have to suffer when the law fails to protect uh, people that are blowing the whistle, which is why we're working to advocate for strong whistleblower protection laws. And as Suled already indicated, there was actually this positive movement on that um, in different European countries. These are the list of countries that have introduced legislation favoring whistleblowers or supporting whistleblowers in the past couple of years, not all of them are actually dedicated or comprehensive whistleblower legislation. Some introduce the issue and part of anti-corruption laws. Some of them are even quite crappy. The French law, for example, is not supporting or like we're estimating that it's not going to protect whistleblowers in practice because it still relies on um, whist whistleblowers to prove that they acted actually in good faith, which is not always this easy to demonstrate. But at least we can see there's political will. There are other initiatives ongoing, one which is very prominent um, and happening in Spain with a huge support of civil society, which is actually quite impressive. And um, since we're already in Holland, and you can see Holland on the list, let me just quickly mention that the Dutch law which is called House of the Whistleblowers Bill and which in, was introduced in 2016. It's actually one of the best whistleblower book, bills on the books worldwide um, because it mainly, because it in, in, includes two functions, uh, no, sorry. It includes um, a dedicated agency for whistleblowers that has two separate functions. One would be um, an advisory center that takes in complaints from whistleblowers and supports them in their disclosure. And the other being an investigation center that initi initiates investigations into the claims made by whistleblowers and cooperates with the authorities. So you have like everything under the same roof, basically. And... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know you have time. There is... Yeah, and just to finalize this, as Suleta already mentioned, there is also finally movement on the EU level. Um, the European Greens have presented a draft directive on whistleblower protection just to prove that it actually can be done. And um, there is also the Committee of Judicial Affairs in the European Parliament that recently presented a draft report that will be presented to the Commission, and uh, which then will hopefully propose a draft legislation the only problem is that we do not yet have a legal basis. So in case there is any smart lawyer in the room who would like to come up with a bright idea about this and knows his way around or her way around uh, EU law, I'm happy to take in um, suggestions. And the other thing is that some MEPs have expressed the fear that uh, the Commission would propose legislation only on whistleblowing in the financial sector because that's pretty tangible and because you can't count the numbers of money that's actually been saved. Um, but that would rule out protection for reporting any other wrongdoing and um, there is significant evidence for why whistleblower protection, if it's not comprehensive and not like um, fully implemented, fully mon monitored and um, horizontal mainly, can in some instances even be more dangerous for whistleblowers than no legislation. But um, skipping UK because we have to move on, but Canal will talk more about the setbacks of um, faulty legislation, and I'm leaving you to that. So, thanks. Good. No. Oh. 
Right. Hello, everyone. So, um, as Veronica mentioned, there are already quite a lot of laws in Europe that have been passed to protect whistleblowers. But what you also saw was that, well, these were two videos uh, showing clearly that these laws failed to protect whistleblowers, but there are many, many more cases in these countries, Ireland, UK, where there is also a great law, Spain, France, Ireland, who, who just failed to protect whistleblowers, even though the law was here, quite reasonably good to protect whistleblowers, but it didn't do such. So why do we have this lack of effectiveness for laws? And I think that it's important for this talk to focus on two elements. Um, the first one is the public perception of whistleblowers. I'm pretty sure that if I ask all of you what is a whistleblower, I'll get almost as many different answers as many as you are, because we can ask ourselves the question, is whistleblower someone who's linked to an organization, or is he just like someone who's unrelated to an organization just seeing that something bad is happening somewhere and wants to disclose it? We can ask ourselves, um, are all leakers whistleblowers? Are whistleblowers all leakers? Are whistleblowers necessarily disclosing something in the field of corruption? All these kind of questions. And the problem with this lack of common public perceptions, perception of whistleblowers is that you cannot really get a lot to like, work properly if you don't have the breeding ground in the society that will support its effectiveness. Because law is here, as you know, to regulate our relationships in a society, but society won't let itself be regulated like that if it doesn't agree with it. And the problem is that in so many countries in Europe, we still see very bad perceptions in the public of whistleblowers. In some countries, Whistleblowers are referred to by the term of denunciant. This is the case in, in, in Germany. Uh, so denunciator, sorry. In other countries, they're just referred to by the term snitch, which is even worse. It gives like a really bad, like negative connotation. And in some other countries who've taken take forward, uh, step forwards, it is very neutral. They're called whistleblowers. So if you have no public perception and no public support of a whistleblower, you can have the best internal mechanism, the best law. There will, no one, there will be no one who will be there really and apply the law once you will knock at the door and say, hey, I'm a whistleblower, I have something to disclose. There will be a whole mechanism, but no one to apply it because either they won't know about it, they won't even know that you are a whistleblower, or they just won't, don't have this reflex or this willingness to uh, protect you or just to take care of the disclosure and stop the malpractice that you have um, witnessed. The second reason um, that could explain this lack of effectiveness of the laws is the fact that also in law we have no common legal, no legal definition of whistleblowers. It's like if you take all the countries and even in international law, the definitions are always different. And that comes mainly from the fact that they have been, there have been several approaches to whistleblowing that we could summarize like that. So the first one was whistleblowing as fighters for the fight um, against corruption. Uh, when whistleblowing has been introduced in the law the first time, it was in the US and it was in, the, in this frame exactly to stop corruption in companies because corporate social responsibility wasn't enough. Uh, because people were from the inside, so there were too many conflicts of interest. That was the corruption approach. And this approach is still visible in many countries who have adopted law that only deal with whistleblowing who will disclose facts against corruption. But all the others disclosing facts about violation um, of rights that will be put in danger the environment or violations of our privacy won't be protected. The second approach has been the labor law approach, which is why countries like the UK only have laws who will protect private employees. This is the approach that is now being a bit set aside, but still it has been quite an important approach and it has generated a lot of laws that today remain very focused and therefore narrow on this topic of protecting uh, private employees. 
when they witness something in their organization. The third approach is the one that we found in the wake of whistleblowers like, of course, Edward Snowden, Daniel Ellsberg, uh, which is fighting against the abuse of secrets within governments. And this approach is today still very strong, but still it's not enough because you have a lot of collisions with rights like national security and you also won't be able to include in that whistleblowers who will witness things about multinational corporations who are violating human rights. This is completely different as um, abusing a secret from the government. So this is also too narrow. So we had to come up with a fourth approach, uh, which is, well, which is uh, coming up really recently with a case, the Luxley case that I will present you in a few minutes. It's the approach based on human rights and mostly freedom of expression. And under this background, against this background, we see whistleblowers not only as witnessing and disclosing violations of human rights, but also whistleblowers being at the same time victims of violations of human rights because their free speech is not respected. And we also become victims of these violations of human rights because our rights as a public to receive the information that we need to know is also violated. So, the presentation of LuxLeaks. I think I'm, no, that's the right slide. Perfect. So LuxLeaks took place in 2010, uh, and it, will, it involved two whistleblowers and one journalist who have been condemned, two whistleblowers have been condemned in March, in Luxembourg, March 2017, uh, to suspended prison sentence, uh, as well as fines. The journalist has been uh, relaxed. This case involves more than 580 confidential tax agreements that have been concluded between the state of Luxembourg and corporations, big corporations, like McDonald's, Ikea, uh, the Deutsche Bank, that were uh, leading them to pay sometimes even less than 1% of taxes, even though the official rate in, uh, in Luxembourg for corporate taxes is 29%. So I think it's very important to mention this case for two reasons. Laws that don't take into account a broad approach to protect whistleblowers and laws that also are combined with a bad or a two or an, an existent public perception of whistleblowers will just, they won't work. And second reason, because this is the case that has been most obvious in bringing us the vision of whistleblowers as holders of free speech and therefore developing for them new rights or new, new ways of protection that we will see in the third part. So first reason, why was the law unadapted to this case? Well, what they disclosed, these two whistleblowers, were actually tax agreements um, that are legal in principle. The only limit to these tax agreements is that they don't have to create distortions in the EU markets, uh, which means in turn that you have to prove that these agreements haven't been um, granted to other companies, therefore these companies are paying the official rate of 29% and others are paying only 1%, so that creates a distortion. But otherwise they are totally legal. And the law in Luxembourg says that if you're a whistleblower and you disclose something that is opposite, that is, sorry, a, a violation or the commission of a crime in the field of white collar crimes, corruption, money laundering, influence bidding, you will be protected only if what you have disclosed was illegal. But now a lot of um, commission of infractions or a lot of acts that are contrary to the public interest go through tax optimization, which is a very gray area in which it's really, really hard to prove that something is going to be illegal. And Luxembourg doesn't take that into account. So it has been stated by the courts several times when they were the hearings for the Lexley case. Yes, these are whistleblowers. Yes, this is totally contrary to the public interest. The public interest of that disclosure has been mentioned several times by the EU Parliament as well. It is like everyone said it, but still the law doesn't protect it because it is illegal. 
good to mention as well is that uh, the EU Parliament also made a quick estimation, I mean, a quick, um, broad estimation of the amount of money that has been lost through this um, scheme of tax avoidance. Only between 2005 and 2010, and it continued after that, and it still goes on, uh, 60 million euros per year were lost because they were not paid as taxes. So now, going to the facts, how did it happen? So Antoine Deltour was an employee in this accounting, uh, so one of the big four, PricewaterhouseCoopers, a company who was acting as a consultant for big law firms who would just go there and say, hey, take care of my tax, um, uh, yeah, my corporate taxes. And he wanted to leave this company because he didn't feel that he was so any bit, like, in line with what they were doing because he felt that he was doing too much optimization. And before leaving, he decided to copy a few documents from the company, which is something that everyone um, does. This has been also acknowledged by the court uh, for his training and to apply to other jobs. He did that, and by doing that, he was in a file that was completely public, opened. Only thing is that someone who is scanning, the person who was scanning the tax, secret tax agreement uh, from into a file, actually forgot, instead of doing cut and paste from the scanning folder where they go when you scan them, and putting them, so cutting them from the folder and putting them in a secure folder, this person did copy and paste. So these secret tax agreements, they were all there in this public folder. So Antoine Deltour saw that. He said, okay, this is, this is big. This is definitely contrary to the public interest. I'm going to take that and I'm going to see what I do with it. He took that. He started to read it. He didn't really understand what it was, but he understood that something big was happening. And he started to write comments on blog, commenting on the fact that the, e the Luxembourg was just like allowing massive tax evasion and he, the, his comments were very s circumstance. He, was, he seemed to be a guy who had actually facts. And the journalist saw his comments. He contacted him, and then they agreed together that the journalist would be doing a documentary on tax evasion in Europe, uh, in, in Luxembourg specifically. But it was also agreed at the request of Antoine Deltour that he wouldn't disclose the name of the companies that were paying this amount of taxes, so that First of all, his company, his former employer, wouldn't be identified. And secondly, of course, he wouldn't be identified. Journalists still did that. He revealed everything, the, everything, the name of the company. So it took maybe 48 hours for the company to track down the activity and so that Antoine Deltour had taken these documents. And that was it. He just got into the courts and he tried to, of course, justify himself by the fact that he had really tried to think about what he could do with these documents without putting in danger, without just throwing them everywhere to the public. No, he just wanted to raise awareness. And what, when we look at this, we just see, I mean, I think when, when we get rid of all these functions and questions that we connect to whistleblowers, functions of are you disclosing against corruption, we, once we get rid of all of that, the only thing that we see, or that I see, is, is freedom. It's just freedom of expression, and our freedom, and their freedom. And the good thing is that if you start thinking about whistleblowing with the lens of freedom, then you get access to human rights. And human rights, even more than national rights, are meant to evolve with society, are meant to be the space, there is a lot of space when you look at the European Convention of Human Rights or the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, they can all be interpreted broadly so that they can apply to society even when it changes. So, two examples for that, that can represent, and that represents today, clear new avenues for whistleblowers. First one is asylum law. Whistleblowers and asylum. I should switch now. What's other, that? Other way. Uh, all right, the United Nations Convention of Geneva protects refugees following this definition. Refugees an individual who outside of his or her country of nationality or habitual residence is unable or unwilling to return due to the well-founded fear of persecution based on his or her race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and membership 
or membership in a particular group. And this definition at the beginning was meant to be used in terms of in times of war, but then it has been extended, for instance, under the group of membership of a particular group. You can find now um, the homosexual community. You can also find child soldiers. And these are all the, the fruits of evolution of the society. And they were not thought at all um, by the, the drafters of the convention. So we have to ask ourselves, can we actually say that whistleblowers, when they disclose something, are holding, expressing a political opinion? Well, the UNHCR comments on the convention say that the notion of political opinion needs to be understood in a broad sense in order to encompass any opinion on any matter in which the machinery of the state, the government, society or policy may be engaged. And this has led already to a few cases, I mean more than a few cases in the US and also in Canada, where whistleblowers were considered as being persecuted by whom? By the, by the state, because they were holding a political opinion which was disclosing corruption or, or disclosing um, the misuse of power of secrets thank you, uh, in, in a government. So we see here that it's really, if we, if we get this approach for whistleblowers as holders of, of freedom of opinion and holders of human rights, then you use human rights in a way that you're going to protect them like that instead of just trying to apply fragmented laws that mostly going to fail because there's no public perception. And we, in the cases of Julian Assange and Julian Assange and Edward Snowden, we also saw that countries who offer them protection, even though we know that there's a lot of political game under, behind this, but they were Ecuador, Bolivia, these countries in South America, they have in their constitution, it's written that asylum, they give it for people who flee persecution on account of their fight for freedom, for democracy, or for the rights of others. So this is how the, the Geneva Convention is going to be interpreted and is being more and more interpreted. And very quickly, so that we still have time for questions, the right to encryption as well uh, is being now officially recognized by the UN Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression as a component, as a new way of exercising free speech. Well, before free speech would be you just say something in the street, you yell it, then this is free speech. And then in extended to newspapers, and then recently to bloggers, because they were not bloggers before, but now they're also expressing their opinion by your blogs. And now whistleblowers are using anonymity and encryption, and this is being recognized as using uh, your free speech. Uh, so I, I'll, leave it, uh, I'll leave it here, yeah. so that Silet can take the floor. Thank you. So, <laughs> yes. Hopefully I can figure out how to use uh, Robin's flicker here. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly. I think Canel has introduced very well the idea that there's this sort of s swirling point of convergence between what we think about as uh, human rights and the area of anti-corruption fighting and the area of free speech. I like to think in my studies of whistleblowing as an evolving human right, and that evolving human right of free speech is the right to dissent from wrongdoing the specific right to speak out and dissent from wrongdoing. And the reason the word wrongdoing is important is because a lot of the whistleblowing legislation that currently exists today in some countries says specifically uh, illegality or waste. But so much of the whistleblowing that's been high profile and the reason it's been high profile is not just because it's wrongdoing, perhaps it wasn't illegal in Luxembourg to be involved in such a giant tax evasion scheme that was robbing neighbor countries of their rightful income in tax, the tax that supports the fantastic bike laneways here and the great public transport in the Netherlands and schools for everybody, but rather it's something that offends the public idea of what's right, what's reasonable. Is it illegal that a uh, ambulance in Germany should be dirty? Maybe not. Do people find it kind of wrong? Yes. Do people find abusing people who are frail and in old person's homes through neglect and other things offensive? Yes, maybe it's not illegal technically, but it offends our morals of what's right and wrong in society. And that's why it's so important to protect whistleblowers. Now, just before I go on to Ukraine, where there's some interesting evolution happening there, 
I also want to just mention that one of the key elements, there are a number of key elements of what makes a good whistleblower protection scheme. If you go to the Blueprint for Free Speech website, you will see we've got a set of blueprint principles, this little booklet we've put together over time from our sort of knowledge base of experience with dealing with whistleblower laws and regimes in different countries. But one element of it that's been emerging as particularly important is the provision of an anonymous channels for whistleblowers to use, whether that's when they blow the whistle inside. And by the way, academic research may be surprising to some people in that most whistleblowers, by far, in some surveys, 90 plus percent of them would rather blow the whistle internally in their organization first. That is their first preference. But whether they blow it internally or to a regulator or externally to the media or an MP, for example, what they really want is the option of anonymity. This is critical. And this is where all of you engineers who Phil Zimmerman identified when he asked for you guys to put your hands up in the opening speech here at SHA is so important. Because that anonymity is best protected through technology. We've got the confidentiality side of it pretty well down pat. There's some problems with endpoint vulnerabilities. But we know from Ed Snowden that encryption done properly gives you pretty good confidentiality in the pipeline, okay? But what we don't have is great technologies that provide easy to use and terrific anonymity. And that is the crucial area, that is the thing that whistleblowers need, and it is one thing to provide it in law and policy, and that's really where we work and it's essential, but it, you know, all of the protection and laws aren't going to matter if you don't have the tools to ensure it. So that's a task for all the tech people out there who actually want to jump into it. Now I want to talk about just briefly is not LuxLeaks, is Ukraine. Now the reason Ukraine is interesting, uh, it's obviously at this nexus point between East and West, it's a kind of a turf war between US interests and Russian interests. Uh, it's a real war <laughs> on the front uh, in the South and East. Uh, and there are all sorts of other proxy wars being fought in the country. Amid all of this is a really interesting evolution of a set of civil society organizations, grassroots activists, many of them lawyers, who have sprung up, who are trying to fight the endemic corruption, who are not wanting to be owned by one master or the other. They have brought in a law, um, which is the uh, Access to Public Information Law, several years ago. And as part of this, there was mention in it of whistleblower protection. So, this group has gotten together, we've been involved in working with them, to try and draft the first whistleblower protection law, standalone law, in Ukraine. If you go to initiative11.org, you'll be able to read about it in English and in Ukrainian. That draft law, which is a very good draft law, is sitting in the Ukrainian parliament right now. It has gone through one committee. It's got a long way to travel yet. There's resistance from a number of sectors of society, including the corrupt sectors, but also uh, the intelligence community and other areas. But it has some elements in it that make it a standout. And if it goes ahead, it will be a core pillar of trying to rip out the corruption that has been plaguing people in Ukraine for so many decades. Uh, and it will create a transparency, we hope, that will actually allow people to make f more informed choices and not just be buffeted like a sailboat in a storm between two sides, two global powers who want to control it. Elements of it that are particularly important, it includes a wide range of international standards. It has references public interest. Uh, it extends protections to journalists, so one of the best things you can do is to actually make sure that your whistleblower law or regime includes a kind of protective umbrella. And that umbrella is not just around protecting the point at which you reveal the wrongdoing, it also has to extend to the point where you may have to go to third tier whistleblowing that is going externally, and then all the way to the point of the publisher and the publisher being able to publish that wrongdoing in order to be a corrective mechanism in society. So this is a little bit about, these are just some of the activists, they're young, they're enthusiastic, um, and uh, 
they've got a sign in Cyrillic that I can't read um, <laughs> because I don't speak Ukrainian. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless, I do know some of these guys. They're, they're really, uh, they're actually terrific. So there, it's, a, it's a country to watch. We don't know whether or not the law will get up. I hope that it will. Um, it's sort of in the best interest of the people, but not necessarily in the best interest of the power players. Um, that's just a bit of that. Now, the other thing I want to touch on very briefly, one of the things I've done in my academic life at the University of Melbourne is uh, been involved in a long, ongoing piece of work uh, studying public attitudes to whistleblowing in different countries. We've done it in different pieces over time with partner organizations. The original survey, which had 44 questions, was designed out of University of Melbourne, Georgetown University, Griffith University, and has since had support from uh, Greenwich and uh, a set of other organizations along the way. Uh, we actually took eight of those questions and surveyed them across a set of countries over time, including Australia, the UK, Iceland, and more recently, uh, Albania, Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Croatia. Um, the, this is gold standard surveying. This is not you're on the internet, someone click it. This is a like a political surveying, gold standard, go out, get your representative sample, 1,000 people, uh, 1,200 people in Australia, 2,000 people in the UK. So this is the standard that would be used for a proper public poll. And what we found with one of the questions that was asked, which of the following best describes what you think should happen in your society? And we ask, people should be supported for revealing serious wrongdoing. We never use the word whistleblower, because it might be laden with meaning, even if it means revealing inside information. So we tried to contrast, you know, there's a cost there. Or people who reveal inside information should be punished, um, even if they're revealing something seriously wrong, serious wrongdoing, or neither or I can't say. And what we found is not a blank wall. Let's see if we can get that back. There we go. Okay. So here is the people should be punished. Here's an amalgamation of neither can't say, and that's people should be supported. Now here's what's interesting. You see Australia and UK are almost the same, very high support for whistleblowers, effectively. People should be supported for revealing it. Uh, and we use the word inside information to explain information that comes from being part of inside of an organization without using the word whistleblower. Albania drops down a bit, Croatia and Albania about the same, still high at 68%. Kosovo very close again at 65 Bosnia-Herzegovina drops down to less than 50%. Um, people who reveal the information should be punished. Very low numbers in the UK and Australia, 6 and 9%, going up, doubling, 16%. Albania, Croatia, around 18%, Kosovo, 22 Bosnia, 18%. So you can see a bit of a difference. Perhaps there's some correlation with levels of corruption. Not very clear exactly what the answers are on that. But very interestingly, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in the category of neither or I can't say, a third of the people, a third of the people said neither. What they meant was uh, that, you know, they don't know. The other thing that I would point out from this survey uh, is we asked, in different societies, there are different views on the most effective way to take action to stop serious wrongdoing. Which one of these do you think is the most effective way in your society? We asked them, reporting it to people in authority, official channels, reporting to journalists or news organizations, um, reporting it to Twitter, Facebook, or online blogs, some other way, none of the above. Those are actually two separate questions. Number two was two separate questions. None of the way, there's no effective way in my society, or can't say. And here's the interesting data. So reporting it to people in authority, via official channels, very high in Australia at 56%, close to UK 51, Albania at 43, um, Kosovo also very high at 61, interestingly, and Bosnia and Albania dropping much further down to 24 and 43. Reporting it to a journalist, here we see the numbers are a bit closer to each other across the country. So Bosnia and Herzegovina at 12, Kosovo 17, Croatia 20, uh, Albania 22, Australia 17, UK 19. So not so very far from each other, which is kind of interesting. But the really interesting data is 
reporting it directly to the general public via the internet, Twitter, Facebook, or online blogs. So these figures were quite close. All of them are in the 4 to 7 percent range. Now, we know that Facebook penetration in these countries is a whole lot more than 4 to 7 percent. So, you know, in Australia, five years ago, it was about 69 percent. Some other way, exceedingly high in Bosnia and Herzegovina, or I can't say, 60 percent, and dropping down uh, lower in some of the other countries. Why are these figures so low? We don't know the answer to that, but my hypothesis is this. This category of reporting via social media or some other method such as a blog directly to the public is the most personally identifying category. It is a completely non-anonymous option. So if you go via internal channels or if you go via journalist, you at least presumably might have the option of going anonymously. But in this, you specifically won't. So despite the fact that there's huge penetration of social media in these countries, these figures are so low, I suspect, because it is an indicator of the fact that if people were going to whistleblow, they want the option of doing it anonymously. And that, I think, is a very key indicator of the, what the desires are from the public for protections for whistleblowers. Now, I'll just see if there's anything else I need to cover on this before we nick off. Takeaways. Um, a couple of takeaways. Employees and citizens prefer internal and official channels that they can trust, preferably. Um, although we do find recommendations, for example, Brian Martin, a University of Wollongong from Australia's academic, retired academic, has written a wonderful book, handbook for whistleblowers. We're thinking of blowing the whistle. He's not a big fan of going internally, with good reason. Um, that even in corruption-prone corruption -prone countries, people are reluctant to use social media or the internet for whistleblowing, probably for the non-anonymity issues. Um, and self-publishing usually means your identity is being revealed. A seemingly low percentage of people who prefer to contact the media. Why? Is it because people don't trust the media? Is it because they think the media can't actually give them the security even if they want to? We're not sure of that. Um, significant questions and uncertainties remain about uh, the media options. But one of the projects that we're working on at the moment at Blueprint is to try and develop a code of conduct for journalists in the digital age dealing with whistleblowers. Because most professional codes of conduct for journalists deal with things as if it was before the internet, as if it was before anonymous drop boxes, as if it was before metadata crumbs being hoovered up by every law enforcement agency who wants to put their paws on it. And that right being enshrined in law often without a warrant requirement. So those are the key things I wanted to say. We should leave a little bit of time for questions. Take my seat. <laughs> um, but I'm wondering if you guys have particular questions you'd like to ask my colleagues or me. I'll just go back but to that. But first, slide. before the questions, oh. may I start with a huge applause for these three specialists. <laughs> Thank you. What? Oh, this is a thank you. I'll put, no. that I'll put that up after. I, yes. I, 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 I would not let you go without a quick Q&A. So <laughs> please, <laughs> Mr. Engineer. Sorry, I, I was late in, in coming here, so <laughs> I maybe missed something. But there's this tiny thing of the truth. The, the truth? The truth, yeah. The, the, the whistleblower yes. should signify something signal something which is true yes. mm -hmm. In, instead of gossip or ruining other people's careers it should be and how do you establish that it, it is that's a so it's a very good question one of the most important things that uh, we've recommended when we've spoken to organizations that are uh, supporting at a grassroots level the idea of whistleblower protection in their country is there should be a dedicated agency for dealing with whistleblower complaints. And one element of that is an investigatory power to try and verify the accuracy of the information. Not every whistleblower's information is going to be accurate or fully accurate. But 
many will have elements of truth in them. And the most critical thing for people to think about when you're thinking about information whistleblowing is not what is the motivation of the whistleblower, whether they have green hair or blue hair or bad breath, who cares? What matters is, is what they reveal in the public interest about some wrongdoing that needs to be fixed? Oh, thank, thank you for it. Uh, I'm going to install uh, Global Leaks and Secure Drop in a French for the benefit of a French newspaper. And my question is, where should the server be where it would be the safest in Europe? Should it be in France? Mm -hmm. Should it be in a data center? Should it be in the newsroom in France? Should it be abroad? So from a legal standpoint, what, what would you advise? So um, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not an expert on the, places, uh, the safest places um, for servers, although one strategy is to locate your servers in a country that is not friendly with who your likely enemies will be. So if you're doing a lot of reporting on corruption in the French government, having it outside France may be a good strategy, and having it outside France in a country that doesn't get along that well with the French government is not perhaps a bad strategy. But yeah, so, so that, I mean, that's country specific according to um, who doesn't play well with whom and, you know, and therefore what it is. But I don't know that any country will give you ironclad protections. I think if anything, there has been a push in the last probably eight years. I know some actual examples of, of how some of these changes were made that was designed to uh, harmonize the ability for requests, for example, of extradition, um, particularly motivated by some of the whistleblower cases, particularly for the U.S. to ask for extradition, to have uh, attorney generals in other countries have less leeway in saying no. Um, and based on those, in a sense, tentacles going out, you'd have to research pretty pretty thoroughly. I know there were moves in Iceland for a while to try and set it up as a safe haven. Um, with the election that occurred not long ago, perhaps that will happen again. Um, uh, they were certainly considering whistleblower legislation on top of that. But other than that, I don't have easy answers for it. It's a good question. Could, could you stand closer to the microphone, please? Oh, I, I have I'm, it in I'm my thinking... mouth now. It was, clo it was turned off. Oh, but um, still stand close to the microphone, please. How can I stand any closer to the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> I'm touching it. You would want to eat it. I was. Okay. okay. Great. Uh, uh, thank you. I have a question for uh, the slide we saw just a second ago, mm -hmm. where you have the very low um, scores on, mm -hmm. yes, that one, I saying the most effective way to stop wrongdoing and going on a blog or on a social media, and you jumped to the conclusion. Did you not? My thought when seeing that question was, of course not, because nobody reads what I tweet. <laughs> Have you any more questions into sort yeah. of what you, your conclusion? So, so we didn't have the ability to drill down anymore. Part of the reason is that doing public polling is incredibly expensive. So, for example, we looked at potentially doing it in Germany, and it was going to run ten to fifteen thousand uh, dollars U.S. just to do eight questions. It's very quite expensive to do. So uh, we didn't have a drill down on that. But um, I, I ha when I said most effective way to stop wrongdoing, the question was actually longer in the actual thing. And we made a real point with the question to, uh, we circled it very widely to, uh, there's an international whistleblowing research network of people from South Africa to Portugal, researchers in this field. We, we threw all the questions at them, we trialed it, we revised it, we trialed it some more, we revised it, and we came up with something that's actually a pretty neutral set of questions. It doesn't, that's why it doesn't use the word whistleblower, but it tries to actually force the viewer to weigh up a little bit in their mind the idea of there is some cost to violating the trust of an organization. There is some cost to reveal private information from inside an organization. You must weigh that a little bit in your mind for the issue of, of wrongdoing to think about whether you would cross that line. We don't know for sure, yes, is this an, an issue of, of anonymity. It might not be. But on the other hand, 
it seems to be the only thing that is so consistent between countries that are so very different from each other in history, um, in, in politics, in economics, in language. Their numbers are so close, and yet they are all so very different from the penetration of social media applications in those countries. Any other questions? Right. Oh, One more question, because we, we are already late. But, uh, ah, well, never mind. Just do the question. <laughs> That'd be great. It's, it's just a small question. Full disclosure, I'm Dutch. You said the Dutch law was a gold standard. Do you have any Dutch people in your team? Because we have a strange way of making laws in the Netherlands that is, the law is perfect, but the executive is seriously lacking on purpose. So, so they, they say, like, we're going to enforce these laws, and they put two people on it. Do you, you want to answer? I, yeah, I'm happy to. Well, I mean, that, so what's your question? Like, how? No, we do not have any Dutch. Do we have Dutch people on the team? No, we don't. No, it's, so cross, cross. I think what you're talking about is the problem, the dichotomy between you pass a really great law, but then, like, it doesn't get implemented so well. Is that what exactly. you mean? Exactly. That, yeah. That's, so it's nice calling it a law that's the gold standard, but... Can All I the Dutch are no, that doesn't work. Okay, so the thing is that, I mean, you've seen that this law, or you probably know that this law has been introduced, like, not very long ago. So in, in any case, and in fact, we didn't talk about the UK today, where 10 years ago as well, we had something that was called a law that on gold standard that just, you know, now proves to be only semi-effective, actually. So the, the point you're raising is pretty good, but on paper... It is actually one of the best laws that there is. And I mean, I'm, I'm sad to hear that implementation might not be great. I mean, the, apart from the House of the Whistleblower Bill, before that, the Netherlands already had a much better um, set of different pieces of legislation that allowed leaking or um, like not on, this, on the one full of umbrella, compare, but at least compared to other European countries, you were pretty much on the forefront of this. So, and just looking at the piece of legislation that's out there right now, we can, we're happy to see that legislators are actually introducing this kind of, these kind of laws, but um, obviously you're right, we'll have to see where this is gonna go in the next couple of years. Thanks. So one thing that's happened is, you know, the UK legislation was some of the first in the world. Some of the first in the world, particularly to apply the private and public sector, which made it very special. As of next year, it'll be 20 years old. So this is a relatively young thing in the era of laws and society and the balance between the individual and the state responsibilities and powers. Part of why we've published the Blueprint Principles and other organizations have principles as well is as we've kind of clawed our way forward in whistleblower protection, we've been figuring out how do we actually make governments do what they say they're going to do in terms of protecting whistleblowers. So for example, establishing an independent agency that's dedicated to it turns out to be a really good way to do that. So will the Dutch law work? Well, time will tell. It's only very new. But having a couple of these key components in it will actually make it more likely to work than version 1.0, if you that makes sense. Have you tried um, getting I'm, in touch I, with them? That would be, oh, sorry, no, go ahead. Okay. No, but I, I think I'll end this one with a typical Dutch yes. thing, and it is, uh, we, we made some great words in the Netherlands. For example, polar is an international word now, uh, apartheid <laughs> is an international word, and the next one will be gedogen which is unpronounceable by anyone apart from Dutch and Scottish people, but gedogen is typically something which we do in Holland. We make a law and then... A good word. <laughs> and then we don't... Well, we do nothing with it. That's what we do here. Um, you should study that. It's excellent. It is one of the best things we do here. It's well, really good. The, the French have the most beautiful world word, well, for most things, really, but for whistleblower. So whistleblower has a kind of negative connotation. It's like you're a collaborator. In Eastern Europe, it's thought so very badly. But the French word is perfect. But their law is shit. Yeah, yeah, okay, their law is shit, but their word is perfect. What's Canel? the word? Canel will be the native French speaker pronunciator, so I don't garble it. So it's going to be the end, the final word? Yeah. Yes, you have the final word. Un lanceur d'alerte. <laughs> Un lanceur d'alerte. Ah. The early warning system. We throw the alert. Yeah, <laughs> which Cheers. is a great word. It's a great Ladies word. Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much Thank for you. this excellent presentation.